Moderating now is Advisory Council member Mark Cohen. We have a diverse panel here with Schwartzman scholars, a journalist, and a comedian. Enjoy. Great. Uh, th thank you, Margaret. Thanks, everyone, for hanging on. Uh, this is a little bit of a different session from some of the other sessions you've been listening to. Um, the topic, as Margaret noted, is young bilingual and wondering what's next. I may be bilingual, but I'm not on the young side, so I I'm just moderating. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and it's how next-gen professionals are coping with a changed China, a topic that's also very dear to me because I teach Chinese intellectual property law at Berkeley, and I always wonder where are my students headed with whatever information I give them, what will their careers look like, how can I help them? Same question I ask myself as a parent uh, in terms of guiding my own children who also speak some degree of Chinese. Uh, Unlike other sessions where the speakers addressed important issues in which they are involved, here we're going to have the speakers primarily talk about the most important issue themselves. Uh, and it's a bit unfair since um, uh, uh, it's about how they view their career path going forward in light of changing U.S.-China relations at a precise time where I think many of us, not limited to next gen, are wondering what our continuing relationship with China will be. And indeed, in the light of termination of COVID restrictions, whether we should be heading back shortly. Uh, and for some of us who have served in the government, like myself, you know, how much does the two Michaels situation overhang our future, our willingness to travel, how we engage? Uh, uh, or in light of decoupling, uh, uh, what can we do in the tech sector if the country's re technology relationships are falling apart? Uh, and how can we, perhaps most importantly, continue to play a constructive role? It's, it's often not been easy, even in the glory days, to uh, um, play a constructive role in what is often a fraught relationship, even when we were talking to each other. So we strive to create here a panel that's diverse, two Schwartzman scholars, one Fulbright scholar, and uh, different disciplines, different career paths. And I'm going to turn first to Clay Gardner. And Clay probably has a really unique story to tell about uh, migrating from China to city government and how his China background kind of informs what he did in the lovely city of San Jose. Clay. Thank you, Mark. It's good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here. So. As someone who spent pretty much their entire education focused on engaging with China from middle school, when I first became involved with the language through Confucius Institute program, to majoring in Chinese in college at Stanford, and then doing grad school in China, I always just assumed that China was going to be a central part of my life and my career, whether as a diplomat or a business person doing um, trade with China or something like that. So. It was totally never a possibility to me 10 years ago that I would be sitting here today having just completed a term as a local government official just down the street in San Jose. Or that during my time in San Jose, the mayor would be calling me in to do Spanish translations and not Mandarin, and I would really not be engaging with the language that much. And yet, it was during my time in China as a Schwarzman scholar that I actually was first exposed to local government, so not even in the United States, uh, through you know, having the opportunity to shadow officials in places like Baoji in uh, Western China. So that was a really awesome experience. And it was also in China where I had the opportunity to really reflect on the US as a sort of young American and to think about the fraying of my own country, the backwardness you know, in a relative sense of our infrastructure you know, just drive down the 101 or try to take public transit around the Bay Area. Why is it this way? And, you know, how come it was so much better in China? And these questions start to go off in your head. But at the same time, you think there's so much that is great about the U.S. and our institutions and the hope, the sweet sauce. You know, what is that? And how can I, as a young American with China background, contribute to that in a positive way? And it almost kind of has the sense of, like, the uh, Chinese intellectuals when they were studying in Japan back in the day and looking uh, to China and wondering you know, what could be made of this country from what they learned abroad. So I, I really love that aspect. Um, that is all to say that China still plays a really important role in my life. 
whether it's you know so the worldview, construction and deconstruction, the friends and family and you know host parents that I've made on both sides of the Pacific, and sadly, you know, in the last couple of years, a lot of those relationships have been, I guess I'm sure for many of you, reduced to WeChat moments in an occasional scroll on social media, and it's just really sad that that has happened. And, you know, in a more sentimental sense, I have a deep affinity for Chinese music, so I'm always trying to figure out what's current and popular in the Chinese hip hop scene, and, you know, my favorite, which are like the sappy ballads. So it like has such an intrinsic, role in my life that even if I have nothing to do with it from a professional standpoint, it still is this ballast uh, that I like to engage with. I don't know if I'll ever go back um, to Mark's point on the two Michaels. I, I mean, San Jose is just a city, so you know, maybe they don't care, but you never know. Um, and I think I'm really excited about the opportunity to see and leverage cities as a conduit for collaboration to earlier points in different panels. I mean, there's just so much that I think we can still learn from the Chinese experience in building infrastructure and delivering services uh, digitally or otherwise that would be of great benefit to most American cities and towns. And I think it's a, it's a less friction kind of way to approach that cooperation. So that's what I'm really excited about. And great. yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic and I, I really hope that I can go back at some point. Great. Great. Yeah, a different, a different uh, perspective on, on the uh, current moment. Now, Mar Marianne, you're, you're a journalist, and I think we still need journalists no matter how, maybe even the more fraught the relationship is, we still need, we need journalists even more. Uh, and I think, and we've seen some journalists have been thrown out of China, but yet we still need them to go in. How has this current moment affected your own career path? Uh, do you want to go back there, or do you feel like you need to report from afar? Well, um, I, you know, I was born in Beijing, and then I moved to LA when I was 15. So, you know, I, I witnessed the 2008 Beijing Olympics. That was a different time in China when China was very open and wanted to engage with the world. And um, now, obviously, it's a very uh, different type of sentiment that we're witnessing. And I think, you know, I've seen China and U.S. from the China side and from the U.S. side. Um, it is so much more, the opinion seems, you know, like a monolith that a lot of people are talking about U.S.-China competition. Uh, Chinese people are more nationalist now than ever, but, you know, I think under that blanket, there is so diverse, you know, there are so much more conversations and debate going on inside the uh, Chinese language world about, you know, feminism, about uh, social issues, about LGBTQ, about so many things that we're not hearing about. So I feel it's still very important to go inside China because you know you, you can't really get that uh, from outside because you're looking at the internet with the censorship you know people cannot post online and there's danger to talk to people you know maybe on WeChat and people don't want to talk to you if you're you know you haven't met in person so I think you know for me as a journalist it's still very exciting and I'm still very determined to go to China if possible. It reminds me when I did Zoom uh, conferences the past three years my first question was always how how are things in China these days? It wasn't right to the topic because it's so important to understand that background that was informing their overall decision. So uh, someone who knows also something about how things are in China, at least from a particular theatrical platform, uh, um, just can you tell us uh, how you're viewing this moment as a comedian? Yeah. Uh, 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 c comedy is so culturally defined, you know, so uh, it seems to be very hard to do Chinese comedy in the U.S. Mm. or even U.S. comedy in China. Uh, I like, I like uh, this uh, the by the way, it's like the, your question is like, it seems like it, you shouldn't have managed to survive this long. <laughs> uh, I, I, so as a little bit of an introduction, I did, uh, I apprenticed for seven years to a Xiangsheng master in Beijing, learned the traditional Chinese comedy, but I also did Western style stand-up and improv in China for nine years. And uh, then since the pandemic, I was uh, suddenly uh, found out that I live in America now because I can't get back into China for the last three years, which has been a real problem because one, most of my fans are in China. So as a comedian, you make your living doing live shows. And if you can't get in the border, that's bad. Um, but the other problem is, as you said, the knowledge of how to actually make people laugh is so specific to what's going on in a place at a time. And some of that is mitigated by the fact that even in China, when I was making jokes, being the, the Lawai comedian in the room, it was always a little bit about me 
uh, anyway. And even if I'm in America, I can now make jokes about being a Lawai comedian performing for Chinese people who lives here. Um, and, and actually, you'd be surprised if you, if you live in the Bay Area, go and search up the Gui Gu Tu Guo Xiu the, uh, the Silicon Valley Chinese stand-up uh, talk show society. They've been running three years here in Silicon Valley, and they have really good shows. Some of the best Chinese stand-up you can get in the States is right here. So, um, so that's what I've been doing in the interim period is I've shifted a lot of my live work to the internet. Um, which actually has been really beneficial in terms of being able to reach audiences that even before, if you weren't in Beijing or Shanghai or Guangzhou or, or the major cities, it was hard to perform for these people in China. But on the internet, I can now make everybody laugh. And I've also found that the same types of videos that work on the Chinese apps, because the apps are now run by the same algorithms, those apps, act, a lot of the videos that go viral in China, I can be pretty sure that those videos will also go viral on the American TikTok or Instagram or YouTube. And so uh, I think there's this impression that um, uh, even though a lot of that, that comedy is so hyper-local, um, there's also just stuff that people want to laugh, and especially during a time period when everybody is seeing the world close, the people who enjoy the world being open are actually happy to see people still fighting the fight. So, in, mm. and as a comedian, if I fail, that's also funny, so. <laughs> so, so are we gonna see English language Xiangsheng appearing in the United States? Or I don't know <laughs> how much English language Xiangsheng is going to work, but, uh, but this has been one of the, pen, the dilemmas of being a comedian in China the last 10 years. Every year, what you can do gets a little narrower, but every year, my industry, especially the Western style of stand-up, gets bigger. So 10 years ago, no one knew what stand-up was in China. And now there's big TV shows and, and people make their living touring and you know, I can make my living as an American doing Chinese stand-up in this country. So that shows you how big the impact has been. I was, last month I was in Paris and London doing shows for Chinese people living abroad there. Good. So like the, the growth of Chinese stand-up has been so enormous and it's coming in a context where every year it's getting harder and harder to do it. <laughs> so imagine what it'd be like if, you know, if things take a turn in the general good direction, there's really gonna be a boom. Fantastic, and you've succeeded in talking about humor while being funny, which is hard to do. Usually people when they talk about humor are quite serious and yeah. nobody laughs. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Alina, you know, we've heard a lot about technology decoupling and, and everybody is aware that there are certain costs that uh, come with that, but it also seems to me that there's an opportunity to learn in the past from China, and probably a continuing opportunity uh, where China is particularly on the cutting edge. Actually, the more China becomes competitive, the more we should be learning and absorbing from China in different technologies or science. Uh, you're back here in the US. How do you view your China experience as informing what you do here for a US company? Great question. For context, um, I work in tech and I was previously building product in China and Beijing before moving to the States and now building tech here. Um, I, when I first moved to the States, I joined Facebook, um, the Facebook China team, trying to get Facebook into China. Um, as soon as the writing was clear on the wall that that wasn't going to happen, I transitioned to focusing purely on tech in the States. And I feel like to Mark's point about learning from China, I think China 10 years ago was known to be the copycats when it came to tech. Um, but really, if we look at consumer tech now, there's so much that we can learn from what is happening in the decoupled Chinese ecosystem. In some examples, just to name a few, WeChat as a model of a super app, um, very much what Instagram and Facebook is trying to accomplish by having so many apps, so many functions, so many features within one product that was actually birthed in, in China in WeChat uh, years before kind of that strategy and that transition. If we look at Xiaomi, Huawei, Internet of Things, smart home devices, the amount of smart mops, smart vacuums that you can get, um, high, yeah, high fidelity projectors, and the technology and the rate at which those are being built is also immense. JD, I mean, I'm already really happy with two-day Amazon Prime. I was happier in Beijing with two-hour deliveries from Jingdong, and so there's just so much, I think, consumer tech innovation that's going on, and that's particularly interesting because the two ecosystems have been um, decoupled pretty pretty clearly. Um, I think one thing that has changed is when I 
when I entered tech as an industry, my passion and aspiration was to hope to work in US China tech um, and to be a bridge in, in, in that area. I feel like there isn't that many immediate opportunities now, um, given the current climate, but I'm still hopeful in the longer term um, for those opportunities to emerge. Interesting. Clay, I'm wondering, did you ha ever have a similar experience to Alina thinking maybe there's something that you could bring back to the U.S. on China's approach to innovation in your position in San Jose? I think there are definitely <clears throat> ways that the Chinese state delivers really excellent digital services. So as the chief innovation officer for San Jose, my role is really to figure out how we could leverage tech to improve the quality of life for people that live in the city. And my advisor at um, Schwartzman was actually a former government official from Hangzhou that had created the sort of like one-stop shop e-government model, oh, which yeah, is sure. pretty much touted in China and something that I researched while I was there and found really interesting. So there are a lot of things that I think could be learned. I mean, I think the Chinese government has done an excellent job of uh, leveraging tech and consumer tech where people already are versus like just building bespoke like brand new systems that for government, it's just really hard to maintain. It's really hard to, you know. But, but, but you never thought of having a five-year plan for San Jose. <laughs> we, I mean, I think curious. it would be great to have that kind of plan. Uh, just the reality is we certainly don't have the structure that China has to enable that kind of thinking, uh, you know, with politics and with the decentralization. I mean, I think the craziest thing so I actually hosted, um, prior to the pandemic, a vice mayor from Xi'an. And I think I kind of realized in that moment that he did not have empathy for just how decentralized our system is at the local level. And like, we don't control the criminal justice system, for example. That's the county's purview. We don't control public health. But imagine trying to be the mayor of a city and dealing with the pandemic not really having the mechanisms to drive the change or the policy interventions that would be helpful for people. So I think I've kind of become aware of just how um, complicated governance in America is, but there's so many things that I think we could still learn that would be useful. Do, do you think, this is for all of you, but do you think that, um, you know, many of us, I think whatever age, whatever area, we always felt like we were a bridge between two cultures. Uh, and I think the more fraught that area was, my area was intellectual property, the more important I felt that bridge was. So, so much misunderstanding, we could lower the temperature just a little bit and maybe be a hero in the process. Is this still an opportunity to be that kind of bridge in the current environment? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll speak on that because the last three years have basically been transferring the, that people-to-people -people work I used to do in China now onto the internet. And ironically, even as we're all hearing doom and gloom about the U.S. and China irreconcilable cultural differences, the last three years have been the best three years for my social media channels. Because what's happened is, is that, one, during the pandemic, everybody was inside, so they watched more everywhere. But even beyond that, um, the uh, as the world has closed, the people who are interested in the world being open are looking for new models of what an open world looks like. And so the people nowadays, they don't necessarily watch Hollywood movies, they watch YouTube, they watch TikTokers. These are the people that they're watching and the amount of creativity and Chinese creators that are engaging on the Western platforms, even though it's a little easier for them than the other way around, um, but the amount of people that are still trying to go across, it's been really good for those people because the world wants to see collaboration, the world wants wants to see people working together. And so, and, and the other thing I think that's really cool about cultural exchange is you don't even need to succeed at what you're doing to succeed at doing the cultural collaboration. If I try to make jokes, I could bomb all the jokes, but the most important thing is I still am trying to make those jokes and I'm putting them on the platform. I'm showing up every day and posting. And so in that sense, it's actually been a really great time to be doing cultural exchange. I will add though, that it's hard to make money doing it because they like, you know, the facts that, you know, it's hard to set up, you can't live stream as a foreigner in China without a Shen Fenzhong. Uh, Chinese can't set up an LLC in this country if they don't have a green card. It's hard to do that, but that's not the fault of the cultural communicators. That's the fault of perhaps the, the politics and the governance and situation. So, so Mariana, you've talked about reaching out to the Chinese people and bringing their voice mm -hmm. through mainstream media back to the US or the world. Is that, do you view that also as a bridge? Is that a, an area 
area strikes me as an area where there's, particularly in, in an era where we think of China Inc. or, or the Communist Party uh, as dominating the thought process of China, do you view that as your bridge, as something that you need to continue to do? Yeah, you know, I think um, a lot of us, you know, uh, Chinese American journalists that really worried a lot in the past years that that middle ground, that bridge is disappearing. But I think, uh, you know, especially after the white paper revolution, we have seen that the people from both sides still very much want to engage with each other. It's the politics that have drifted a little too far from what is true on the ground. So I think, you know, what is really important for the media to do is to focus more on what people want, like a company that still want to come here, a company that still want to go to China, you know, what uh, America American people and Chinese people, uh, you know, what they what they treasure, what they want, and instead of focusing too much on this uh, political showdown, so I think that's very important, uh, you know, that we kind of bring it to the ground a little bit more. So, is there enough of a future? I'm hearing some notes of optimism, which is good, uh, but do you feel like there's enough of a future? Uh, in bilateral relations uh, in your space at this point in time that you would encourage others, including children that you might have, to say, gee, you ought to study Chinese or you study Chinese technology collaboration or city government or whatever the area might be, or would you say, stay out of it? I know my kids, when they said, Dad, should I study law? I said, no, pursue something else. <laughs> uh, 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 so, you know, you're not going to lie to your children. It, w what would you think? What would you do? In the time frame of children, I would still absolutely encourage investing time into learning the culture, the language. Um, in the time frame of recent grads graduating now, asking whether or not US-China tech opportunities are abundant, I probably would advise against it, at least for the next five years. Um, yeah. So kind of a midterm play. So yeah. Kids, they're going to grow up, they got 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. Anybody else on that? I, mean, I, I just, my own interest in learning Chinese was always from curiosity and from the fact that I just had a great time living in China, a great time studying Chinese. It wasn't ever the easy way anyway. Anyone who tries to learn any foreign language, it's not like this is the easiest way forward. I think the reason to do it is not because you can get a job or it's going to be immediately expedient. It's that this is a great way to live. I've met so many amazing people. I feel like I'm part of something much bigger. I'm, I'm here at the Asia Society. I didn't have any connection to Asia when I was born. Uh, and like all of these opportunities came because I studied the language. The language was the core of all of it. If I couldn't speak Chinese, I couldn't perform. I, couldn't, I wouldn't have met anyone. And so like certainly for my kids, you know, if they exist someday, um, I would, uh, I would advise, I mean, like, if they're curious about learning anything, I think it'd be worth learning. And I think that if uh, they were completely uncurious about learning Chinese, it wouldn't matter how many opportunities there were there. Like, you know, you, you can't force that sort of energy out into the world, you know. I mean, I think for our democracy to survive in this country, we need people that can empathize with and understand people who are very different from themselves. And, you know, when you study a language like Chinese and you grow up, you know, in a place like the U.S. and have no, maybe to Jesse's point, connection to Asia when you're born, I mean, it really forces you to come to terms with your own sort of inconsequence, you know, in the scheme of a multi racial, ethnic, linguistic, multi sort of perspective society like we have here. So I think it's been extremely valuable in just making um, young public officials that have had the opportunity to study not just Chinese but other languages more empathetic and hopefully that can be uh, something that leads to more bridges being built in the future. Sure. Now Mariana, you grew up bilingual, so maybe to rephrase the question, being involved in the bilateral relationship in some capacity, is that something you would want your children to consider? For them to be in this space? Yeah. Um, you know, I, th I think I'm very much, uh, you know, as my parents, they're, they're very, um, let me do everything I, I want to do. So I think if I have a children, I want them to choose the path right, of their sure. own. 
But you know, I think uh, learning Chinese and English is definitely a must. And I actually am very agree with uh, what Clay said that we need more people um, that can learn a different language and be be very empathetic to a different culture. You know, I, th I think we need more people like that. Probably we also need employers that think that's a good skill uh, as well. I and, and if I would yeah. add one thing on the language, the uh, this has already very much changed from the time that I was studying Chinese in college. The amount of like improvement in the translation engines and Google Translate and Baidu Translate is enormous. Mm -hmm. The problem is not literally speaking the other language. The problem is communicating, as you say, in an empathetic way, learning the stories, watching the TV shows, being a part of each other's reality and world. Because like, if we are gonna make money by working together, we could probably grunt and figure out how to get the contract to work out. The problem now is not that we don't have enough Chinese people that literally speak English or enough Americans that literally speak Mandarin, it's that we can't communicate. And so that communication, uh, a lot of that comes in, it, it starts with the arts, it starts with culture, it starts with food, it starts with um, technology because technology brings all of those things in front of our eyes, in front of the phone. So it, when I go and do talks at schools and I see st students that are studying Chinese, you should definitely learn Chinese, but not literally so you can translate how to say like steak in one language to the other. It's because there's a whole world of amazing creative people out there and whole life to be lived that right now is blocked off because you only speak the one language. And, and I think that's true of a lot of other languages, not just Chinese. Chinese, though, is very interesting because it's kind of created its own strange bubble reality that has so many interesting things that you just can't access if you don't speak the language. The subtext. The, sub the, and subtext. the subtext of all of that as well. So um, the language is definitely the key to all of it. And, and hopefully, language will still remain uh, politically neutral. Just learning the language for the purpose of communication, I think, will be literally the last thing to go if we're fighting. Um, and so that's hopeful in that sense. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. If uh, uh, this wasn't a question I prepped you for, but if you were on a desert island with one book, would it be in Chinese or in English? Oh, uh, <laughs> probably English. I, I, I read slower. Although, if I'm on a desert island, maybe I want to drag that book out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good time to hit the yes, sun key. The, the, you know, uh, I, up all the <laughs> yes, I, 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 I was asked that question. I said maybe Gu Wen Guanzhi or oh, Zhang Show. You're, you're a braver uh, man uh, than uh, I am. Because you know, <laughs> I could look at it over and over each year and discover yeah. something new. But yeah. Any other thoughts on that? You know, I just want to add uh, as yeah. well that exactly like you said that it's the communication that's really important. I think, you know, in the States, um, Asia has long been seen as like such like a foreign land. It's so far away. And I think sometimes people kind of um, think about Asian people or Chinese people as like so far away from them, you know, it's so different. But I think American people and Chinese people, Asian people are, are more similar uh, than, than some people think. And I think it's very important to see each other from like a very human angle and that, you know, we, we, we're very, you know, we have a lot of middle ground. We have a lot of similar features. I, yeah. I agree with that. Uh, maybe we could take some questions now. We have some questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. Can't see, there's a hand in the back in that table over there. That's a question for Clay. So Clay, I was very uh, impressed, actually, because very, only very few people actually heard, actually, when the China came back and sort of think as American, how can we demand better governance? That's a much deeper question, right? So, and yeah. I, I really want to, if you can just spend maybe one more minute to explore that. I want to see more people actually start thinking about how can we make this country better, but better governance. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could uh, bloviate for hours on that subject because <laughs> now I'm a politician. Um, but I would say if you just think about infrastructure alone in a place like the Bay Area to contextualize for us locally, you have to show people what's possible. And oftentimes, like, they simply just don't know what's possible. Think about from like a zoning and development standpoint. We have, if you grow up here, an idea that there's a residential area, there's a commercial area, everything is below two stories, and if it's not, you know, it's gonna be awful, and there's gonna be chaos, and then when I have the opportunity to talk with 
folks from the Japanese government and from Tokyo Metropolitan Government. And they're like, actually, like, we have this really interesting case study on how we have basically developed hub models around uh, our train stations. And there's all kinds of mixed use developments there. And then you show people in San Jose or any place in the US, like, hey, look at this. Like, this is so awesome. And like, how do we, how do, we do this? And, I think you do see a lot of grassroots efforts to improve governance in this country. Um, everything from like integrating the fare system for the transit sort of web that we have here with all the different agencies. But there are so many young people who have technical skills, for example, that come to me and they're like, hey, how can we volunteer as a software engineer for the government? I've noticed that the website's really awful. You know, I can fix it. And there are so many programs now, just in the last couple of years, whether it's um, Code for America, or the United States Digital Service at the federal level, that I think demonstrate like the willingness of people to volunteer to make the system better here. And I'd actually be really curious to know, you know, to what extent that exists or that opportunity exists for citizens in China to contribute to their own system. I feel like it's just, it, it's really hard, I think, if you have ideas to operate if you're outside of the party state sort of apparatus. And I think that is like a really positive thing about the U.S. So hopefully it gets better. You know, it, 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 these observations are really interesting to me because in the, in the legal space and in intellectual property, I think there's lots that the U.S. could learn from China, uh, including, in particular, uh, facilitating small business use of the IP system and the legal system. But try to sell that in Congress when there's so much anti-China feeling. Uh, maybe, maybe there's greater hopes on a local government level of learning from the better things that China has to offer and, and thinking about how we could roll them out in the United States. Uh, some of the other stuff might be a hard sell. Any other questions? It's hard for me to see. There we have one person. Can a few of you speak to how you have communicated your China experience to your employers, how you've contextualized that, and what do they see as the valuable elements from, from your experiences? Um, at least for Facebook, I shared that I founded a beef jerky company in China, um, grew, grew up born and raised in Hong Kong, and just generally had a lot of interest in figuring out how to bridge Facebook not being available in China, but China being very interested in advertising to the rest of the world through Facebook and figuring out how to climb the firewall to do so. Ultimately, Facebook never successfully entered China, but it was successful in creating the one passage of ad revenue from China out so that China could, uh, Chinese companies could advertise Chinese products at least to the rest of the world. And so that's kind of the, the one example that comes to mind in terms of advertising past Chinese experience to an American company that had interest there. I haven't found that many relevant other opportunities where that could be applied to, um, but that's the first one that comes to mind for me. Yeah. I, I think for me, I kind of sidestepped some of those issues by continuing to self-create. So I was a, you know, I'm a comedian, I make internet content. <clears throat> uh, internet content, a lot of it you make your money by having some sort of product come on as product placement. And I didn't want to just do junky product placements. And so I started a tea company, my own tea company, where I had really good tea in China. And I found out that the skills I had learned as a bilingual comedian uh, actually are super unfair advantage in, in making tea content on the internet. Because it's entertaining, it's bilingual, it's true to the, it's true to the culture. And I think that people feel the energy in which I'm doing the exchange uh, still comes across even though it's in another area. Would I have ever been able to convince Lipton that they should be doing this? Probably not. Um, but you don't have to convince them if you make it yourself. Um, and I think that once you show the actual value of it, and then there's numbers, there's viewers to the site, there's dollars in revenue, those numbers are very convincing. Um, and so I think taking that first step where if you really believe the, the experience from China is valuable, if it is valuable, you should be able to show it somehow. 
there should be a practical way that it can get across and I think convincing people on little evidence or hoping that the prestige of having gone on TV shows that no one's heard of in China here has not been that useful. Um, but the actual kind of, again, starting from scratch and then using those skills to build something in the States has been more effective than trying to convince Netflix they should give the white guy the Chinese comedy show. Uh, so um, yeah, I think that like, you know, look for where the, the skills are and then, and then those skills, if they're real skills, they should out here as well as there. It reminds me of my friends at a Remen University who used to introduce me as, uh, this is Ke Hung, Mark Cohen. Mm. He's very famous in China, but not so famous in the United States. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to my uh, open mic experience. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> how was it for you when you applied for that job in, in San Jose? How did, how did your background play out? Well, San Jose is a very diverse city. I mean, here where we are actually right now in Santa Clara County, it's actually, I believe, a majority Asian county. I don't know that there's that many majority Asian counties in the United States. Mm. I mean, it's like 58% to the last census. And um, Mayor Sam, uh, I think, is super interested in learning about what models from places like Taipei and Shanghai would be applicable in San Jose. So there was that piece. But I think in a more direct way, I have noticed over the years that like there's whole communities of people here that are Chinese speaking that are super politically engaged, but just on WeChat. And you know the city and you know, a lot of the government structures here just have not really ever tried to make that bridge happen and to you know, improve representation, improve outreach, and really reflect um, a lot of the new communities that we have, especially more recent immigrant groups. So I think like the WeChat uh, sort of marketing thing was really interesting to him, mm -hmm. and he took a chance, so that was great. Mariana, I'm assuming that as a reporter going back to China, uh, being bilingual was a kind of a, uh, a significant asset, or, or did it play out in any other way? Uh, I think for a lot of newsrooms, China definitely is one of the top uh, areas that everybody needs to cover. So I think, you know, uh, the hard part is getting the visa. Um, so I think a lot of people are still waiting for their visa to, to go to China, so, yeah. Interesting. Do we have time for another question, or we, yeah. any other questions? Over there. Uh, Jack Wadsworth, uh, Morgan Stanley. <clears throat> I'd be curious, um, uh, from your level in the food chain, how does entrepreneurship feel today uh, in China versus uh, the United States? Um, I, I guess speaking for me as, I, as the tea guy, I guess. Um, I think. Uh, I think the advantage of the internet has been that it has never been easier to reach a niche audience if you're really good at what you do. So within making like T videos for a relatively brief time, a couple months of posting once a day, basically all of the T community that is there is on, on uh, TikTok and Instagram, they were already finding me. The, every day the tech people essentially work for me. They're building better algorithms to help me find that audience. Um, the flip side would be that if I, if you aren't really good and you can't outcompete the other people there, I don't have any idea how you would make it as an entrepreneur, because you'll just get wiped by the people that are that are getting the free traffic. I don't pay for any ads. I make all my videos, and then people wind up finding me because of the tech. Um, the annoying parts of the entrepreneurship, a lot of the annoying parts have come down to the pandemic. Like I had to start a business during the trade war when I couldn't go back to China. So there was a lot of video chat and there was a lot of um, accepting that like, you know, for product quality, some stuff, sometimes we're just gonna have to send people a new tea set if the first one breaks because I have no capacity to send quality control people. And because it was so clear I don't have that capacity, we're just going to have to find another way to do it. So I hope that the um, I hope that once the borders reopen and the uh, travel goes back, I think a lot of those challenges will be easier to deal with. Um, but none of it would have been possible if I didn't spend nine years in China. 
And so that's the big thing I'm worried about is all these people that may, like, you know, the, if the population of foreigners going to China and the population of Chinese going to America drops, we're not going to see the problem now. There are just companies that 10 years from now would have existed but don't exist. And that's kind of what I think we'll see the result of this, this period in the, in the, the, the breaking of the uh, exchanges. We're going to see that result in like 10 years when stuff hits that dip. Alina, what, what have you seen in the entrepreneurial culture? Yeah, from the experience of having co-founded a jerky company in Beijing and also from the perspective of someone who aspirationally wants to found something technology related in the future, I feel a lot less hopeful actually. Um, at least from the tech perspective, looking at what's happened in the gaming industry, um, as well as the education industry and the changing policies and crackdown. Um, there's, there are just so many large companies, large tech education companies, large tech gaming companies that, that were built for years. Um, monopolies even in, in the fields that they were in that overnight um, lost almost all value. And so at least when thinking about entrepreneurship from a tech perspective in China, I'm a little less hopeful um, because I just feel like gaming, I can actually understand the rationale behind. Education, I think, really took me by surprise. And at this point, I don't know, you know what's next. What's the rationale for what's next? How do you even get a sense of what might be coming? Um, yeah, and so I probably would feel more inclined if I wanted to, to do my own thing to, to, to start in the right. States as opposed to China. Has a diminishing U.S. presence affected the entrepreneurial culture in China in any way? That's a great question. I don't know if the diminishing U.S. presence has affected entrepreneurship more or the government crackdown, and I would probably wager a bet that it would be the latter, hmm. more so than the former. Okay. Good. Two minutes left. Any additional questions? For this group, yeah. Thank you, uh, Bob Newman, Cal, Cal Maritime. Uh, I don't have any idea what what traditional uh, Chinese humor is like, and I was wondering if you could just give a one minute um, <laughs> <laughs> demonstration. Tell us your song. I'll do, I'll do what I did actually last night. If I'm, I'm already standing, I might as well. Uh, but um, one of the uh, traditional Chinese comedies is a linguistic performance art. So you need to speak with such amazing energy and precision that you draw the audience in with the way that you talk. Uh, but do that in Chinese. Um, and so one of the ways that they do this, or they add it to a joke, is they have these things that are called guangkou, which are these like mini monologues that are designed to show off the speaking ability. And so I'll do one of those really quick for you right here. This is called the di li tu, or the map. Uh, it's a whole bunch of different country names. It goes like this. Tai ping yang, Indu yang, Da xi yang, Bei bing yang, Ojo And then, and then you'd work that into the routine. It's a two-person comedy. There's a joker and a straight man. So I'd be like, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. Oh, I was traveling. Oh, where were you? Well, I was in uh, yeah, Taiping, yeah, Indu, yeah, da, si, yeah, Beiping, yeah, Ojo, yeah, Jovin, ba, 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 all the way like down like that. So that's a joke. <laughs> anyway, thank, thank you all very much. Thanks to our, our panel. Uh, actually, I entered this panel feeling a little bit pessimistic, and I'm feeling at least lightened by the humor. <laughs> thank you all.